Okay, so I teach Torah with faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. And a couple of years ago, there was a Christian scholar on YouTube that did a video about how Christmas is not pagan. Now, just like some of you right now, I laughed about that and said, isn't everything about Christmas pagan? I mean, among the tribe I hang out with, the Torah keepers that have faith in Yeshua, the Hebrew Messianics or Israelites, whatever terminology you want to use, everyone believes that Christmas is pagan. In fact, that's probably one of the number one things we can all get together on is that Christmas is pagan. So I'm thinking, look, I'm going to blow this guy out of the water, but because he's using historical documentation, I need to make sure that I come with historical data. But what I found out is that I cannot conclusively state that Christmas is pagan. And in fact, I don't see that it copied pagan holidays at all let me just show you what I found. First, let's begin with the calendar of Philokalis. This is a Roman almanac, and it has the only known date of any celebration on December 25th other than Christmas. Okay, and now this is the Roman calendar, and the only date is this, December 25th, birthday of the unconquered, games ordered, 30 races. Where the scholars have a little bit of a division here is some say that this is a record of Christmas, of Jesus Christ, um, theoried birthday, or this is the birthday of Sol Evictus, either one. Now, with that being said, let me show you what other dates I have found to make this come full circle. So right here through all of my research, this is what I found. Constantine, now I'm not going to go into who he was, but I assume that most people watching this video know who Constantine is and that he is the one that people assume took Christmas and that there was a holiday already on the Roman calendar where they would bring in a fully erect tree into the home, decorate it up, have a big feast, exchange gifts, and that it was to a pagan god. Then what Constantine is alleged to have done is to just switch out the name of the pagan god with the name of Jesus and turn it into Christmas. That is the usual accusation. And that's what I thought happened. But when you look at the dates in history, Constantine's conversion was in 312 AD. The Council of Nicaea, with which I assume you're well aware, that was where they had this vote to see which holidays they'd put in place and that type of thing. That was in 325 AD. The first recorded Christmas is in 336 AD. The earliest possible source for the pagan festival is that calendar of Phil Philokilis, and that is 354 AD. So the calendar of Philokalus, the one I just showed you, if that indeed is for Sol Evictus, then that is the earliest source for a pagan festival on December 25th. If it was for Jesus Christ celebration of December 25th, then there actually is no source for a date of December 25th that had a celebration for any God or for any birthday of any kind, period. Now that is amazing because here is another source. This is a historian, an English historian, Ronald Hutton. And not that he's the supreme authority, but what he speaks of is true. You can go and check it out for yourself. There's no hidden agenda here for him. The official calendar of Julius Caesar marked the solstice at the 25th. So that's just given indication winter solstice. The traditional pagan Roman calendar had left this period as quiet and a mysterious one. So going back to when Christmas was put in place in 336 AD, there was actually no celebration listed on the Roman calendar. That didn't occur until 354 AD, almost 20 years later. Isn't that amazing? It even mentions Saturnalia, which many say is Christmas, but it ended before December 25th. And then the other celebrations kicked off after December 25th. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I can't prove that there actually was a specific celebration on December 25th for any pagan deity, 
prior to Christmas being put in place. It appears from every calendar source that that day was blank, especially on the Roman source, which the main accusation is made. Also going back to Horus in the, with Egypt, you can even go back to the Greeks and check it with Poseidon, all of these winter solstice holidays. There's nothing specifically being done on December 25th, you have holidays being celebrated in the winter solstice time period. But however, we have that also with the spring solstice. Well, we can't say that Passover is pagan or it is a copy of a pagan holiday simply because it's celebrated in the spring solstice. But what it shows me is, is that we just can't say something's pagan because it's celebrated at a time that pagans are celebrating their holidays. I mean, I don't know how many of you do Hanukkah, but Hanukkah is celebrated during the winter solstice time. And also with Hanukkah, it has mirror images of Greek winter solstice celebration festivities inside of it through an eight day oil burning miracle fable, a myth that never was in, an, in the original Maccabean literature where Hanukkah, the rededication of the temple is found. That was added much later in about the third or fourth century in the Babylonian Talmud is where you have the eight day oil burning miracle in place. But you could say, and there's good evidence that that is a pagan addition to the holiday. So do we throw out Hanukkah just because of that? Many of you would not agree that we should do that. Or some of you may say birthdays. Should we do those? I mean, there's no command in the Bible to do a birthday. And then we see that they have candles put on a cake in a circular fashion, which some say is the symbol of the moon or the sun. And then they blow them out and make a wish. Well, is it Yahweh answering that wish? Is that who they're thinking about when they want their wishes granted? Well, that's a pagan element added to birthdays. There's no prohibition in the Bible against birthdays. And many choose to celebrate their birthday. Many that celebrate their birthday and celebrate Hanukkah and will even celebrate things like Thanksgiving, they won't celebrate Christmas and they call it pagan. Okay, so back to Christmas though. I'm sitting there thinking there's got to be something pagan about this Christmas tree. I mean, who brings in a full grown tree into the house? And when I read about in Jeremiah and in Chronicles and in Kings, we see that they did evergreen worship. Now that was a little different because they did it in tree groves. They also had pagan orgy houses around around the groves where they had temple cult prostitutes and they would do just heinous sex acts. So it was a little different than putting a tree into your home and decorating it. But I'm thinking, God, you know, isn't Jeremiah 10 about that until I actually went to use it and studied Jeremiah 10 and I found out, no, I've been using that wrong the entire time. Let's just look at it together. So here we are, Jeremiah 10, three through four, and it says, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an ax by the hands of a craftsman. Now that starts to get me to think a little bit because I was like, well, wait a minute. Does it really take a craftsman to cut down a tree and bring it into the home? Well, no. So he must be actually making some sort of image in it. And they decorate it with silver and gold and they fasten it with a hammer and nails so that it cannot move. And that really got me thinking, well, what about a Christmas tree do you think can move? You wouldn't think, I need to fasten this thing down so it doesn't run off. So I started to study a little bit more. There's passages in Isaiah that speak of this, but one clear one is in Psalms. So let's just go to that. Psalms 115, 2 through 8. Why should the nation say, where is their Elohim? Our Elohim is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. There are idols. Now this is of the nations. Our silver and gold. Well, there we have similar terminology, such as what was found in Jeremiah 10. The work of human hands. The work of a craftsman. Same terminology. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. Well, that's why you would use a hammer and nail to fasten it down so it wouldn't move. And they do not make a sound in their throat. And those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. So does a Christmas tree have a mouth, eyes, ears, nose, feet, hands, 
No, none of that. This was not about a full grown tree that was unchiseled or unmarked. So then I'm thinking, well, where does a Christmas tree come from? It has to come from some pagan event. And what I found is that there is not one single winter solstice festival that has the act of bringing a full grown tree into the house. Not one. Now you'll have where they bring in greenery, but they do that in the springtime and at other times too. And even at Sukkot with the Israelites, we would make sukkahs with greenery and things such as as that. So there's nothing pagan about bringing greenery into your house. But if you bring it into your house because you think the greenery will ward off evil spirits, well, that is superstition and you should not do that. But where then does the Christmas tree come from, I asked? Well, it comes from the 16th century in Germany where they would do Adam and Eve festivals. And in the festival, they would have the tree that was found in the garden. And then they would bring that tree after the festival into to their home and they would have apples on it. And then also not included in this article right here, but in other articles, it is theorized that the reason lights got put onto the tree is because Martin Luther saw the tree outside like the glow. And so he put candles on the tree to simulate that effect inside the home. But there is nothing that I can find that any winter solstice pagan festival ever brought a tree in and decorated it. It simply just isn't there. Even though I do agree, it gives me strange vibes bringing it into the house. And ourselves, we do not do that. Now, on a further stretch, I know that some... Torah teachers have said that the gift giving itself is pagan. Well, you can see from this these verses here, there is nothing pagan about gift giving. Even with Yeshua HaMashiach himself, when he was around three or four years old, the wise men, the men of the Orient, they came, known as Magi, they came to Yeshua's home and they gave him frankincense, they gave him myrrh, and they gave him gold. And that was so that the family of Yeshua would have money to live off of while they were on the lamb hiding out in Egypt so their son would not get murdered. And so we can see you can give monetary gifts, gifts of food, however you would like. There's nothing pagan of gift giving at all. You know, and then a lot of this got me thinking, well, I guess there's nothing wrong if somebody wants to celebrate Yeshua HaMashiach, his coming into the world and make it all about him. I mean, it's supposed to be a Christ gathering, a Christ mass, even though that the world celebrates Christmas, they have nothing to do with Christ. It's all about the money and the gifts and the drinking and the food. And I hate to tell you this, but I've been at some feast days with Torah keepers that were just exactly like that. And it was a cry in shame. So you just can't say it's all the people of the nations that do these type of things because no, you know, we've been guilty of it too. Just be honest. Now with this understanding, seeing that it isn't exactly unlawful to do, my thought was, well, you still can't add any days of celebration, right? We should only celebrate those days lined out in Leviticus 23, which are a complete sign of Yeshua HaMashiach's first and second coming. They are beautiful. You know, Passover, unleavened bread, feast of first fruits, Pentecost, feast of trumpets, atonement, Sukkot. These are all beautiful. Seven feasts designed to show you and map out Yah's salvation. Surely we shouldn't add to that. That would just water it down, I said. And so I said it was actually adding to the word of Yah if you added feast in. Until I got with brothers, we studied. I saw that that's just not the case either. Let me show you this. Here we are in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. And this is so interesting because in the seventh month, in the Hebraic calendar, is a fast that is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. However, there are other fasts mentioned here. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh, Yom Kippur, and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness in cheerful feast, therefore love, truth, and peace. So what you have is the fast of the fourth, the fifth, and the tenth. Those are added in by men, traditions of men. And not only is there no rebuke for adding those in, however, the prophet actually promotes and says that Yahweh backs 
and supports these additions. So it cannot mean that you're adding to the commandments of Yah by adding days of celebration in. That is not forbidden. You're just not allowed to add days in that make void the commandments of the Most High. That's why I'm showing you with Christmas, I cannot find pagan origins that Christmas copied. In fact, the history that, that I just showed you would more indicate that the pagans copied Christmas and added to Christmas as Christmas made its way around the nations and they adopted it into their customs and then they would add yuletide logs and mistletoe and things like that into it but those were not found in the original christmas santa was not in the original christmas these things were all added in so i would say yes remove those things from that celebration if you choose to participate Another mention of something being added in by a tradition of man that Yahweh did not condemn is Hoshana Rabbah. Now that's something that is added in by men to the end of the Feast of Sukkot, and then it actually goes a little bit further. Some actually stayed in their sukkahs during this man-made feast. And what they would celebrate is that Yah would bring rain to his people and that they would have great sustenance, right? And so you actually see this in, ironically, it's in Zechariah again, that this is supported in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. It indicates through the prophet that if those that do not come up and celebrate the feast of booths, this is in the end of days that no rain will come upon them. This is according to the tradition of Hoshana Rabbah. You actually also see this in John chapter 7, where Yeshua makes a play on it, and he goes up on the last day of the feast, the great day Yeshua stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whosoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So on that day, they were having the celebration for Yahweh to bring life-giving water to the people. And this is so beautiful because Yeshua HaMashiach stands up and says, I have the life-giving water from the Father you've been asking for. And not only are your lands going to be watered, but your bodies will be watered with this life-giving water from the Father, speaking of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Son of part spirit. It is so beautiful how he inserts himself into this man-made tradition. Another one that Yeshua inserts himself into is the Feast of Dedication. Here in John chapter 10, verse 22, it says, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Yeshua was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon and the Jews, they jump him right as he comes in and they say, how much longer will you keep us in suspense? Tell us plainly if you are the Christ, right? And then just skipping down, you can go and read through this on your own, but he ends it by saying, I and the Father are one. He's basically saying, I am Yah made and manifest in your presence. You see, what they were celebrating was Hanukkah, which was a victory over a man, Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek king that said that he was God manifest. It's in his very name. And the Jews stood up, the Maccabeans, and overthrew him. So this is where when Yeshua walks up, you say that you're the Christ. And then he says, yes, and I and the Father are one. At that, you see in the next verse, the Jews pick up stones again to stone him because they're like, you are saying your God manifest? He's putting himself into the feast. You're celebrating this. I'm here to tell you, no, Antiochus was not God manifest but I am. I love it. So then I had to repent because it's obvious in the Bible that you can add feast as long as they don't make void the commandments of the Most High Yah. And as long as they don't overshadow the feast days, the feast days should be the number one celebration on the calendar in your life. And see, that's where the early Christians made their biggest mistake is because they did away with the law because of their conflict with the Jews. And they thought, hey, these things we don't need to do anymore. We can create our own as long as we make them about 
about the most high. That's going to be okay. Hey, we'll keep the Sabbath and we'll keep all the laws that apply to the seventh day Sabbath. We're just going to do it on Sunday and have our own day. That was a big mistake. You can't take and use traditions to make void the commandments. Yeshua rebuked the Pharisees for doing such things. Now, see, I'm not the only one that's coming to this knowledge. I shared last week on the Shabbat that a gentleman named David Wilbur, best known for his connection with Psalms 119 Ministries. He did a video where he doesn't say Christmas is just totally not pagan, but he's like, ah, maybe. He goes, there's really not hardcore proof. He chooses not to celebrate it. I don't celebrate it. The next gentleman, ministers of the new covenant, I'm going to show you, they don't celebrate it either. But all of us that are studiers that actually go to historical data in the Bible, we cannot conclusively say that Christmas is pagan. We cannot do that. And by the way, I will link David's video so you can go watch it. It'll be in the description. He does just an excellent job with the video. And this is ministers of the new covenant. And this is what he has to say. And I'm going to add a little bit of commentary in here because I did see in the comment section on his video, he's getting beat up on this. And I think it's just a sad thing because we need to be more balanced than we are. If you're going to have disagreements, please bring sources to the table actual sources that date back to the second, third, fourth century that give us good data that we can go by. Oh, here we go. I do not go along with the Christmas is not pagan crowd, but I also don't go along with the Christmas is pagan crowd. I think that it's best to find a balance in the middle, not because I'm trying to straddle the fence, but because I think that the truth is found in a balance. There are some things about this particular time of the year that have nothing to do with paganism. And that's where I'm at. In case you don't know me, I want to bring balance to those that keep the Torah and have faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. Because I know that when we were in the mainstream Christian churches, it was all faith, faith, faith. And there was no works to back and support that faith. You know, an application of law. There just wasn't there. We tried to be good people and do that type of thing, but really what is good, right? We need the Torah to define that for us. And then when I came over into keeping Torah with faith in Yeshua, it seemed to be all legalism, all Pharisee. I mean, even with Passover, it just seems like it's more about the Exodus with Moses coming out, bringing the people out of Egypt than it is Yeshua bringing people out of the captivity of sin and death. It's just so interesting on the, these both weighty sides, all law, all faith. We need a good balance scale. So I like that he said that. I like that he mentioned balance here. I do take the position of the calculation theory. I know some people take the history of religions theory. They say that's the older theory, and I disagree. When you look at early Christian writings and they're talking about the birth of Christ, it's all about calculation and not about trying to adopt pagan time. I think they were genuinely trying to figure out when Christ was born. So that's true. That's the evidence. And it comes from the early Christian theologian, the, what they commonly call the early church fathers, it comes from their actual records to their people. So there was no reason to go and hide or obscure anything. This is actually what they thought. Now, you may think this is funny or goofy, but this is what they thought back then. There was lots of things. Go and look at medical journals from back then. They thought all kinds of things, right? That women's hair was actually like a woman's reproductive organ. But without getting too far off, let's go ahead and look at this. So this is from August. This dates to the fourth century of when the first Christmas was ever celebrated. And he says, for Jesus is believed to have been conceived on the 25th of March, upon which day he also suffered. Now, what they believed is that the day that a prophet of Yah died, that was the date that he was conceived into heaven. And that also must then be the date that he was conceived into this realm on the earth. So the day of a prophet's death would also be the date of a prophet's mother's conception. So they have March 25th. Thereby, you just simply add nine months to that and you get the date of December 25th, which he says, but he was born according to 
tradition, this is their mathematical tradition, upon December 25th. That's what all the data shows. Now, before you're like, these are liars. They're lying about the birth of Yeshua. They're not lying. They simply use mathematics, and you may disagree with those mathematics. Then what I have to say about this is, is what about the mathematics that some people use to say that Yeshua was born at Sukkot? Now, I'm not going to go into the full details. You can just simply search yourself the information and the mathematics that people use to formulate a Sukkot birth date for Yeshua. But they base this off of John and Zacharias, his father, that did the priestly rotation at the temple. He did it in the course of Avia. Now, this is all found in Luke. You can see that there. And this in the Avia, it was the Hebrew month of Sivian, that is May. And then it goes into Luke chapter one, and you see that Elizabeth, this is uh, John's mother, was six months pregnant when she ran into Mary. And then they just do the mathematics and they come up with a date, because they will say that's around Pentecost, and they come up with the date around Sukkot, then the fall that Yeshua may have been born. Now, with this mathematics, I mean, there's no proof that Yeshua was born in Sukkot. Do I believe Christ was born on December 25th of the winter solstice? I don't know, and neither do you. Nobody knows when he was born. The Bible just doesn't tell us. Despite what people try to say, they try to come up with all kinds of things. I absolutely do not believe he was born on a feast day at Sukkot or Passover. Everybody's going in different directions for the census. Everybody's going to their own hometown, not to Jerusalem for the feast. It doesn't make sense at all for it to be a feast day when everybody's going in opposite directions instead of one locality. Luke chapter 2 mentions Passover when Yeshua goes with his parents up to Jerusalem for Passover. It mentions it. Why not mention Tabernacles earlier in Luke 2? just doesn't make sense. It's a messianic myth. I am 100% agree with that, that there is no hardcore evidence that Yeshua was born during Sukkot. It simply isn't there. You go to Luke, and Luke, now, he was a historian. Luke was also the one that put together Acts. So he was very well known for giving lots of detail in the things that he wrote. Just look at the way that Luke writes. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria. Look at all the background you get just right there so that you have a great overstanding of the, the backdrop of this time frame. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Now, Bethlehem is about 5.5 miles south of Jerusalem, where he would have actually been going if it had been Sukkot, because it was commanded to go to Jerusalem. We know that Joseph obeyed the decree three times a year to go to Jerusalem, the place where Yah put his name, because just like was mentioned with ministers of the new covenant when he was talking here, they went to Passover with Yeshua. Remember, that's when Yeshua ran off and they left and went back home and Yeshua was having a debate with the scribes. Who has taught this child all these things? So that was, that was awesome. But anyway, we know that this third, so coat's not being kept here. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger, which that word, I know that they say it could mean sukkah. It still has nothing to do with it being the feast of Sukkot because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, he may have been born in the fall or late fall, but at the Feast of Sukkot, there is no validation for that. So would it be fair for me or others to accuse you of being a liar or whomever says that Yeshua was born at Sukkot? Would that be fair to say you are lying about it when you're actually trying to use mathematics to come to that result? I just don't agree with your mathematics and neither do other Torah teachers. But that doesn't mean that you're lying about it. So why do we say that about the early Christians who they use mathematics to come to their conclusion? Even, you, even though you say, well, that's dumb mathematics. Well, the same could be said about the Sukkot. Because again, Luke, the historian, does not even mention it. Right. But that doesn't mean December 25th can be substantiated. I think what took place in early Christianity did not look like Christmas today. Matter of fact, I know it didn't. 
what took place in early Christianity is Gentile converts came up with the idea of having a feast in honor of the Lord's birth. It's kind of like the Trinity. The Trinity developed in Gentile converts, not in uh, Judaism or Jewish uh, Messianic believers. The earliest uh, feast of the nativity of our Lord in Christianity was probably just a church service. They may have had a meal and sang songs about the birth of Christ and then a teaching on the nativity, but that was it. There was no Santa Claus or reindeer or stockings hung by the chimney would cure or anything like that. I don't celebrate the modern day Christmas. I'm not going to start celebrating the modern day Christmas. But the fact of the matter is everything associated with the Christmas season is just not pagan. It can't be substantiated that it's all pagan. Objectively look at the subject. Get rid of your emotions. Listen, don't Google something and think the first thing that pops up on Google is the truth. Well, this gentleman's findings were the same as mine. When I went to do the research, like I just went through today, I saw that when Christmas was put into place on December 25th, they did it through mathematics. You may disagree with the mathematics. Now, also, there was no date of celebration on December 25th on the Roman calendar. That is proven by the calendar the Roman Almanac of Philocalus. It's right there for you to see other historians noted as well. The other thing is, is that things added into Christmas, they may or may not be pagan. So if you're uncomfortable with those things and you want to still celebrate Christmas, simply remove those things and make it all about Christ. The other thing is, is can you add in a day? Is that unlawful? We've seen that you can add in days according to history. Zechariah spoke of adding in multiple fast that Yahweh backed and support and said, yes, go ahead, you should celebrate. We saw with Yeshua on Hoshana Rabbah and with the Feast of Dedication, both of those, he never rebuked them. He just inserted himself into them and said, all these things are about me. I'm the fulfillment of all things. The main thing to remember is you need to be celebrating the Feast of Yah. They are the ones that point out the salvation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Those are the most important things you need to celebrate. But speaking of celebration, some may say, and I've even thought this, well, there's no commanded celebration in the Bible to do Christmas. Well, there's no commanded celebration to do your birthday or to do Thanksgiving or to do Hanukkah, or there was no commanded celebration to do the fast of which Zechariah actually signed off on. However, there was a celebration on the birth of Yeshua though. So in Luke, during the birth of Yeshua, there are shepherds in the field. And again, there's no mention of them actually keeping Sukkot out in the field, but they're in the field nonetheless. And an angel appears unto, unto them and says in verse 11 of Luke chapter 2, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Yeshua HaMashiach. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a with the angel, a multitude of a heavenly host. So these are a multitude of heavenly imagers, such as you are an earthly imager. And they were praising Elohim and saying, glory to Elohim in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So that is beautiful. They were having a celebration. I can easily see why that church theologians would read passages such as this, see no problem because they've read in other areas and they lived among the Jews that were adding in days of celebration and said, let's add in one of our own dedicated to Yeshua HaMashiach. And they did that and they celebrated with joy and there was no copy of any pagan holiday. So put down in the comments, what do you take away from all of this? Where are you at with these things? I see it as a good level way to reach out to those that are lost, that they don't have the full understanding of the Torah, that it points to Yeshua, that he is the image. And we all need to come back to Torah as to walk in a way that's pleasing to our Savior. And I think this is a great way to do it without calling people pagans and heathens that actually are not celebrating anything pagan. Now they could take something like Christmas and abuse it, such as somebody can abuse alcohol. Somebody can abuse food and make those things both sin. So if they abuse the holiday like many people do, then yes, it would be sin. And if you're adding in all kinds of pagan elements, if you can do your research and find out it is pagan, or maybe you just get a bad feeling and want to remove it, 
then remove those things. If you were to keep those things around, well, what is not a faith is sin. If you believe that you should not celebrate Christmas, well, then that's exactly what you should do is not celebrate it. I just want to show you the evidence that you need when you learn how to communicate with others as to why you made your decision. Shalom. If you like this, we do teachings every single Shabbat at 10 a.m. Central. Come and join me in the family. We're having a blessed time. Would love to see you there.